These men are the forgotten survivors of the Tibetan resistance that from 1956 to 1974 took up arms against the Chinese. For much of this period, their closest ally was the CIA, which helped to train and arm them. The CIA codenamed this secret operation ST Circus. More than 30 years ago, these now retired CIA officers ran ST Circus and worked closely with members of the Tibetan resistance. Their memories of that time, of the cause, and the people they once supported have never left them. That's fine. Well, remember, we used to comment back and forth that we were grateful that we were working with the Tibetans instead of the group involved down in the Central America problem with the Bay of Pigs, <laughs> that uh, we were fortunate to be involved in a good program. They are such an incredibly unique people. I don't, I don't think, even ourselves, even within the agency and perhaps not even within our own group, do we realize just how incredibly unique they are. They still believe their religion. Oh, yeah. But they're, they're, I've never met any people like them. I never will. In late 1949, shortly after the communist takeover of China, the People's Liberation Army invaded Tibet. Tibet's tiny army was quickly defeated, and by the summer of 1951, Chinese troops were marching into the Tibetan capital, Lhasa. The 17-year-old Dalai Lama, Tibet's temporal and spiritual leader, was forced to come to terms with the Chinese. Throughout the 50s, Chinese troops poured into Tibet. In Lhasa, the Tibetan government maintained an uneasy coexistence with the Chinese. But in the outlying provinces, the Chinese began to impose communist reforms. In 1956, they began the destruction of monasteries in eastern Tibet. ちゃばて。ちゃばて困りです。ちゃばなませて、こっちや。茶やめばち、レッドとうさんさんちげ、せばちちいろ。だ、こら、かてちゃん。そうそう、え、ダビトンヘナンダ、ヒュートンヘ
News of the rebellion spread to Lhasa, where a group of Kamba traders formed an underground organization. Representatives were sent to India to muster support from outside countries. In India, the Dalai Lama's elder brother, who was living in exile, came to see them. They'd start sending their messages, and what they're asking, they're asking arms, and I don't have arms. But then I introduced what you call Americans through the direct foot of contact with the Tibetans, and then come in this, what you call, so-called American participating, training, and recruiting, and sending the Tibetans to the United States for training and this and that. Started like that way. In 1956, the year the CIA got actively involved in Tibet, America's fears about an international communist conspiracy were at their height. We are united in detesting communist slavery. We know that the cost of freedom is high, but we are determined to preserve our freedom no matter what the cost. There was this whole sense that as the Cold War had come to Asia and that the fear that, which had concentrated obviously primarily on Europe prior to that time, now was this idea that communism was monolithic, communism was working together, that the aggression had to be stopped someplace and that wherever you could do something to stop the Chinese, it had to be done. In order to explore what the CIA could do in Tibet, six men were selected from the Kamba group that had come from Lhasa and secretly flown to the Pacific island of Saipan. I was in uh, Saipan in uh, early 57 when uh, we got the cable from headquarters uh, from Washington, which said that indeed uh, there was going to be a Tibetan a group coming to Saipan for training without too much more information other than that they wanted to cross the board training and uh, that the people in the group were supposed to be able to communicate uh, once they went back into Tibet, which meant, of course, clandestine radio. Atan Norbu is the only surviving member of that test group. Maggie after nearly five months of training, Atar and his partner were dropped near Lhasa with radio equipment, the first men ever to be parachuted into Tibet. Their survival and their ability to make contact with the resistance and report back to the CIA would determine the next stage of America's involvement in Tibet. This is where it came, yeah. You could have heard the cheers from one end to the other when that first message arrived in that the guys had arrived and they were safe. Well, yeah, that was indeed a, a time for celebration. And uh, it was, you know, it's a pretty incredible achievement to think of. Here, 
Here you are, what, 15,000 miles away. Message going out. Uh, guy sitting over there with a hand crank generator spinning this stuff out. We knew the answer, the, getting the answers to our questions right away. The two-man radio team made contact with the resistance in Lhasa. Here, the Dalai Lama's government and the occupying Chinese forces still maintain their uneasy alliance. Eight months later, in the summer of 1958, the resistance moved out of Lhasa and set up a military base in southern Tibet. The radio team went with them. More than 5,000 men gathered here, and a series of attacks was launched against the Chinese. The two men radioed the success of the guerrilla campaign to the CIA, who then made the decision to step up its support. They made their first arms drop to the resistance. In late 1958, the CIA decided to train more Tibetans, and a top-secret training facility was created in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. This whole area here is Campeo, this whole area, up and down the valley here. That's the area in which we trained the, the Tibetans. We thought that the conditions up at Camp Hale uh, somewhat duplicated uh, the conditions in Tibet. Mountainous terrain, the temperatures and the, and the climates. The Tibetans were brought up here in buses and they were, they were trekked into this area here, which was all cordoned off this from mountain to mountain. That was patrolled by military police. The training area consisted of a series of Quonset huts in which the men lived, and we had a recreational area where we were uh, able to give them some recreation, and we had classrooms and so on and so forth. And of course, in connection with the training, uh, we would uh, make overnight trips up into the mountains to teach them hit-and-run type tactics, guerrilla type tactics, if you will. Over the next five years, 259 Tibetans were to be trained at Camp Hale. America Jala Jin, the Peshu, US in the Jiris, and the Tachim Shivijan, mean at the Gabushivijan, Jemmy and Tabarjan, America Tensor and Luban, and Zamalin Dakores, and which she is not sort of the college Shivjurwa. Then Nazar sang that packing the Kajan, Chip and Mam, Shivuji, Yetomas, which is Kurt Najit Morris, Ruadin Jigorda. It was unique in the sense we were working directly with people who believed very much in their own cause. And that, I think, gave it a rather unique quality. It was a thing that certainly had caused the tremendous rapport. And I, don't, I just got to hooked on these people. They were great. And then I started learning about their cause. And uh, it seemed to be something that I would like to lend myself to and could certainly do with wholeheartedly. We, we had this group and we trained them and the people who did the training, of course, uh, f fell in love with them. From an emotional point of view, quite apart from national interest and pragmatic uh, situation, all that, we felt so strongly about the Tibetans themselves and the Tibetan cause that if we could roll the clock back to the time when they were truly independent, we'd love to do that. During the training period, we learned that you know, the objective of training was to gain our independence for the struggle for Tibet. The idea was, all of us was gradually go back to Tibet down there and organize the resistance movement, organize way, not in our so that we can, you know, pressurize the Chinese gradually, force them to leave our country. That was the main objective. In our uh, games room, we had a picture of Eisenhower, signed by Eisenhower's to my fellow Tibetan friends from Eisenhower. So we know that. So we <laughs> during Eisenhower's period. So it was, uh, we thought it's, you know, even from the Eisenhower himself is giving us the support. 
Although the trainees at Camp Hale believed that they were being readied for the struggle to regain Tibet's independence, this was never the official American policy. I think basically the whole idea was to keep the Chinese occupied somehow, uh, keep them annoyed, keep them disturbed. Nobody wanted to go to war over Tibet. Uh, that's pretty clear. We didn't go to war over Korea, and we didn't go to war over Indochina. We weren't going to go to war over Tibet. And so it was a nuisance operation, basically nothing more. And I would think that from the American point of view, it wasn't going to cost us mu very much, <clears throat> either money or manpower. Anyway, it wasn't our manpower involved. It was a Tibetan manpower. And we would be willing to help the Tibetans become a running sore and a nuisance to the Chinese. The anecdote I like to tell about Alan Dulles was the fact that they asked me to go up to the director's office and brief him on what was going on in Tibet. He says, now, where is Tibet? <laughs> we stand up on the leather couch in his office, and he has a National Geographic world map up there, and he's pointing to Hungary, and he thinks, is that Tibet? <laughs> I said, no, sir, it's over here where the Himalayas and, uh, it's really cool. It <laughs> By March 1959, the situation in Tibet was coming to a head. In Lhasa, news spread that the Dalai Lama had been invited to the local Chinese military camp to attend a theatrical show. He was to come alone, without his bodyguards. The people of Lhasa gathered outside the Dalai Lama's summer palace, determined to protect him. Meanwhile, the resistance was in control of a large swathe of southern Tibet. The CIA made a second arms drop. Two days after the Lhasa uprising, the Dalai Lama, disguised as a soldier, escaped from his palace. These pictures show the Dalai Lama and his entourage escorted by resistance fighters making their way south into guerrilla-held territory where they hope to set up temporary headquarters. The radio team met up with the escape party. About every 24 hours, they would send us a message giving us their location, and we were able to take that material and then feed it into the uh, intelligence bulletins that were kept the senior officials in the government informed as to the location, the actual location of the Dalai Lama on his escape. And so this had gone on for better part of a week, and it was a Saturday night and I got a call from the office that a message had come in which was unusual the Dalai Lama was asking for asylum well this was a critical piece of information and it had to be handled very quickly and so I took that message and went down to my office and it was after midnight at that time and I called my boss and told him what it was and he said well go ahead and send a message to India and to Delhi and uh, let them proceed with what they can do so I did that and it, it got it was on the wire in less than an hour and I came home and about 
three thirty or four o'clock in the morning, I got a message that the answer was back, and that um, Mr. Nehru had approved the asylum. After a 19-day trek across the mountains, the Dalai Lama finally crossed the border into India on the 31st of March, 1959. The Dalai Lama's decision to flee was his. He didn't team up with any of the people that we knew until two or three days uh, en route, where one of the teams that had been dropped in before, one of the radio teams, then joined the uh, escape party and then were able to keep the American government informed as uh, he went along and his progress. So in that sense, it was another intelligence coup on the part of the uh, minor one. I mean, we knew something the rest of the world didn't. The Dalai Lama's escape sparked an exodus of refugees as tens of thousands of Tibetans followed him into exile. The guerrillas in southern Tibet suffered major setbacks as the Chinese went on the offensive, and before long the majority had fled to India. However, small pockets of armed resistance continued in other parts of the country. Between 1959 and 1960, the CIA parachuted four groups of Camp Hale trainees inside Tibet to make contact with the remaining resistance groups. One of the trainees on the first mission was Baba Lekshe. <laughs> In the autumn of 1959, the CIA parachuted a second group of 16 men at Pemba, a desolate region northeast of Lhasa, where thousands of resistance fighters had gathered. One of the fighters on the ground was De Chen, who met the Camp Hale trainees soon after their drop. <laughs> We were getting messages to the effect that we are as determined as ever to resist, but we cannot do it without significant inputs of troops and weapons. And basically, they wanted, they wanted us, I suppose, to come to their aid with an army. Uh, uh, ideally, that was never in the, in the cards. And I think uh, their disappointment was, uh, was shared, obviously, by, by us simply because uh, we knew it wasn't possible. And we understood at the same time that that was their last hope. That's what they thought was their last hope of uh, becoming uh, free of the Chinese. The <laughs> Bomb 
we knew from overflight information that monitoring Chinese air flights that they had uh, they had discovered Pembar. And the sad, uh, the sad, sad story is that very few chose to go and leave, and understandably so. And indeed, uh, that group uh, came under merciless attack by reinforcements. The Chinese came in with long-range artillery. They came in with aircraft. They bombed, and they captured uh, thousands. Or, uh, I think the more accurate statement is that they uh, they killed thousands and thousands and thousands and captured maybe a, a few hundred. Dechen was one of the few that survived the carnage at Pembar. He now lives in exile in India. In January 1960, the CIA parachuted the fourth and last team into Tibet. Pu Sung was the only survivor of that mission. His team met up with a small guerrilla force. After several days of running battles with Chinese soldiers, they were surrounded. <laughs> Before he could bite into his capsule, Pu Sung was knocked unconscious. He was in prison in Tibet for nearly 20 years. Following his release in 1980, he was able to escape to India. Well, the other sad part of that is uh, no one had an accurate read on Tibet in those early years. You know, there was a golden opportunity there at one time, and I honestly believe that it would have changed, uh, could have changed considerably. But the Chinese did the smartest thing when they first came in. The first thing they did was build the roads. Build the road. What was that for? Not for anything except to be able to get the troops in there. It was we never expected they were going to come in in the numbers that they did. And that, uh, that was a poor reading on, uh, I don't know, our part, somebody else's no, part. intelligence was yeah. not that good. It was almost non-existent. While the parachute missions were taking place, the CIA agreed to support the exiled Tibetan resistance in a new operation. The plan was to send small groups of men secretly into Nepal and from there into Tibet, where they would set up guerrilla units. Mustang, a remote corner of Nepal that juts into Tibet, was chosen as the base. The idea was it was going to be kept a secret operation too. In many ways, it was that was foolhardy. It's hard to keep a secret in India. It's hard to keep a secret among anybody. When the uh, word got out, and instead of uh, the lovely controlled movement, there two or three hundred people, a couple thousand moved over there, and suddenly moved over into Mustang, and we were confronted with a ready-made base and a ready-made problem. The CIA was forced to change its plans. It agreed to support a 2,000-strong military base in Mustang itself. In the autumn of 1960, almost a year after the initial group had arrived in Mustang, the CIA made its first arms drop.
Four Camp Hale trainees were also parachuted in, and about 20 more came over land. Training began in earnest, and the guerrillas were organized along the lines of a modern army. From now on, the Mustang Resistance Force would be funded by the CIA. The commander of Mustang was Baba Yishi, a former monk and resistance leader. 